Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. Our guest today is Matt Doyle. He is the Global Head of Product Safety at Procter & Gamble and Vice President at the LiveWell Collaborative. Matt, I'm so grateful to be able to talk with you today about innovation storytelling. Thank you so much, Katie. I'm delighted to be here and and thrilled with respect to the topic and and the conversation we're going to have. So tell me where your personal story of innovation began. Yeah, it uh, it started as an undergraduate at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. Um, my senior thesis happened to focus on uh, studying blood physiology, in particular the impact malarial infections have on red blood cell health and life expectancy of a red blood cell. And surprisingly, we discovered um, a pathway to clearing the malarial and parasitic infection, at least in mice. And so that was not our intent as we were starting to do the research. And it was like one of those wow, aha moments, right? And as a young student, it was it was transformational for I me. Bet. So it uh, it inspired me to go on to graduate school um, and then to move into an R and D innovation environment at Procter and Gamble. And there have been a couple of examples at P&G that have really kind of codified this notion of, of the importance of innovation and, and the excitement of innovation as well. Um, a, a couple that I'll, I'll share with you. One is um, the, the Crest White Strips innovation story, which um, really is uh, a, a wonderful example of uh, an aha moment in science and discovery. Um, I love crest white strips, and I'm sure most listeners are grateful for the the invention. So, yeah, tell us more. Yeah, you know, so we were struggling as a as a company because we're all about oral health and and dental health, and and have been for quite some time. And we knew that consumers aspired to um, whiter teeth, and and they view the whiteness of their teeth and the straightness of their teeth as real signals of their overall oral health. So when two people bump into each other, the first thing they do is they look at their smiles, right? Mm-hmm. And and so it was very important at an emotional level because it said, hey, this is who I am. I'm a healthy individual. And so we'd been looking for years to find a way to create genuine, true whitening of tooth enamel. And that had been strictly the domain of the dental office, right? right. You know, you could go there, um, undergo um, many hours of treatments for an ex- expensively yes. Um, yes. Uh, priced therapy <clears throat> and come away with that Hollywood white actor, actress type smile. And so a couple of the innovators in our program had been looking for how we can take the chemistry that you need to have to create whitening, true whitening in the oral cavity and keep it there long enough so that it actually work, right? So in science, we talk about rates and kinetics of reactions. And the problem with the mouth is that your saliva keeps clearing everything that you put into your mouth. And the technical problem was how do you keep the material present in a way that would be both safe and effective? And so we had done some real great work on the actual basic chemistry, but keeping it there long enough was the challenge. And at the same time, in another part of our R&D organization, we were developing um, wrap materials for food preservation and um, actually licensed some of that technology to GLAD so people understand that the GLAD press and seal food wrap is actually a PNG discovery. Interesting. And um, so the team that was working on that technology, material science, wrap materials, right, happened to be in the cafeteria talking to one of the guys that was doing the chemistry work. And um, it, it's really a fascinating material because it has little dimples in it, the, the food wrap. Yes. And as you depress those dimples, they change the uh, surface tension and they cling uh, to whatever object it is. You know, it's the, the, the great demo is you can turn your salad bowl upside down <laughs> yes, and yes, the salad stays it. in and shake it, right? Um, and so the, the Paul Segel, who was the innovator in, in our organization, um, kind of looked at that and said, hey, have you ever put anything into those little dimples? 
And the material science guys said, why in the heck would you want to do that? <laughs> they wouldn't work if you put anything in there. And he said, well, could, do you think you could, they could contain chemistry? And they said, yeah, we never tried that. So Paul literally rushed back to his lab and, um, and put, he had created a gel with the whitening chemistry in the gel. And he, he, he spread the gel across the food wrap material um, and then cut it into little strips and he wrapped it around his teeth and it, and it wrapped beautifully, right? It stayed in place. <laughs> yeah. Um, even when the tongue bu bumped up against it. And he literally, a few hours later, comes running into my, my, uh, my lab in my office. What, and what was your role at the time? I was the director for uh, product development for the oral care business for okay. Procter and & Gamble. And, and Paul said, I figured it out. Look. And he grabs me by the shoulders. <laughs> And he pulls his face right up to my face. We're standing nose to nose. And he goes, look, it's working. And I'm looking at him going, what, what are you talking I about? I don't see anything. And he goes, that's the beauty of it. You can't even tell it's working and it's there. And that's how White Strips was born. We because basically, of a moment in the cafeteria yeah, and outside the box thinking. And, and exactly. Two technologists who had, had a predisposition to think out of the box and be creative in the moment. And, um, and so we disrupted the field. We were the first to create, you know, a, a consumer safe and effective uh, whitening technology. And, and, you know, how many proms and weddings there have been since, but it's a hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars worth of business for the company. Yeah. So new business development, new product discovery, uh, great consumer, um, you know, need being met in that way. The the interdisciplinary collision in that moment, just, I love that story for that reason. And I'm thinking about, um, it seems to me that there was already a clear technical brief and understanding of the challenges inside of your innovation team at the time in oral care. And that as soon as you saw it, there was excitement there. Tell us about the journey to get alignment with the larger organization. So um, did you utilize different storytelling techniques? Were there other challenges after you saw the product you believed you already, I think, had strong alignment in terms of what the consumer's desire was? Um, so what was the next step after after that point to, to get more buy-in, to take it to market? Yeah, so we had to get really clear about our technical product story um, at, the, at the science level and, and ensure that the product was going to be able to perform under many different uh, anticipated use and, frankly, misuse scenarios. Um, you have to map that out. So there was some due diligence we had to do as, mm -hmm. as scientists and engineers sure. to, to make sure that we felt confident that the product was going to be able to deliver time and time again under any set of circumstances um, and, and create a delightful wow experience for consumers. Um, then we had to... So that was gathering the evidence, doing the basic science, right? Being fact-based, um, being balanced and pressure testing our assumptions and hypotheses um, as well, but seeking counsel and input from mm -hmm. others um, as well outside of our organization. Um, you know, we, at the time we were a toothpaste company and a mouthwash company, right? And tooth whitening and selling these white strips with a, a gel on them was not something that we were structured to do from an operations or a supply chain standpoint. Sure. So um, the storytelling element of it is convincing management, um, not just R&D management, but commercial management, that there really is a business opportunity here, that there's going to be um, you know, a great return on investment um, because it's going to require significant capital investment to be able to bring this to, to the forefront. Um, you know, we, we were in the lab bench um, you know, spreading uh, whitening gels across food wrap and with a pair of scissors cutting things out. You know, how are you going to scale, scale that. that in a manufacturing context? And so there were some challenges associated with that as well. But first and foremost, convincing um, the company that we had the right to be in that business mm -hmm. and we could do it in a meaningful way that would change the lives of consumers. So that was consistent with what we saw our mission as an oral health care company, as Procter & Gamble, a consumer products company being. So um, really the storytelling that took place was around sharing the vision, actually 
letting people experience the strip, you know. So we repeated that experience that I had with Paul in my office and in my laboratory over and over again with the senior executives in the company. Um, and they understood it in an instant, they yes, could tell. Yes. But we had to frame that in a storytelling context. Yes. Um, we, we couldn't do it just as you would traditionally do it as a, a scientist or an engineer. Sure. I, I hear sort of three key techniques that sort of drove buy-in for this. One, you always place the consumer's desire and journey at the heart of it, at the heart of the story. You already mentioned, you know, think of all the proms and weddings and uh, relationships or professional careers that grew as a result of that product. And you also, you know, when you very first started the story, mentioned uh, that that research around how uh, sort of your, your your oral health is a reflection of your, your whole being health, you know. And so, Having that understanding and, and always keeping that at the core, I'm guessing that was important in all of those pitches in turn, to get internal buy-in. Oh, most definitely. And, and you just mentioned something that was actually the kind of nidus of, of another aha moment for us, which was, you know, oral health being more broadly uh, relevant in terms of overall health. Um, and, and that had to do with some of the work we had done with um, pregnant moms um, and the relationship that exists between oral health and some of these associations that are now coming forward in science and epidemiology that suggest that your oral health can actually affect your cardiovascular health, your um, uh, uh, diabetes profile and predisposition to diabetes, respiratory health, mm -hmm. um, and also um, pregnancy outcomes. Right, yes, yes. And so that was something that we decided to explore and probe a little bit as well and see if we couldn't um, find a way to create um, an enhancement to oral health while women are pregnant and determine whether that had an effect on the um, either the gestational age um, or the birth weight of the babies that are born while mom are under, um, you know, good oral hygiene and our oral care. What and did we, you find? We did some pilot studies and we were able to show that, um, and these are just in indicative of associations at this point. There is some more uh, clinical work that needs to take place, but it does appear that um, if you can improve the oral health of moms while, while they're pregnant, um, you can increase the longevity or the birth age of the baby. Um, and their birth weight as well. That's incredible. So as profound as that sounds, um, you know, we may begin to think about new ways to innovate in the future um, as it relates to oral health. You know, the significance of the outcomes are, are no different than the benefits associated with diet and nutrition changes, lifestyle changes, avoidance of alcohol, those kinds of things. You know, brushing your teeth and taking care of mom's teeth may be the important element to add to that uh, regimen in the future. It's it's so uh, so powerful to hear how that core understanding of the consumer and and also to to me the what I hear is an element of shaping the future here inside of of the innovation stories coming out of your lab and 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 your innovation teams. There's an element of not just giving consumers what they want, but helping to do the research that will indicate what they might need to be as healthy and as happy as they can possibly be. Absolutely, right. And, and you know, we, we um, have about 5 billion people a day using Procter & Gamble products. So of the 7 billion people on this planet, 5 billion of them are using Procter & Gamble products. And so that gives us the opportunity to talk to consumers. We, we talk to millions of consumers every year, and we try to understand what are their stories. Um, what are the things that they struggle with? What are the tension points in their lives? What are the jobs they feel could be done better? Um, and try to get at that. So storytelling plays a, a foundational role for us right from the get-go. So the consumer, we're, we're listeners of stories that the consumers tell. And we use some techniques that help us help them articulate what's on their mind. So often a consumer can have a story and they just don't know how to get it out. Yeah, right? sure. And so we use uh, storytelling techniques, scrapbooking as an example, and, and, and basic storytelling and anthropologic techniques to be able to allow them to get in touch with 
the the kernel of the story or the important feature that is um, emotionally important to them. And and if you can connect those in a really clear, understood way, um, you've got great opportunity to innovate um, as well. And so then we play their stories back to themselves and to their peer group, right? And see if those stories resonate. So we're all about using storytelling as a platform for understanding. Um, And then we go and innovate on the basis of that as well. Does that mean that at the point that a product is, you're sort of conceptualizing how to bring it to market? And so now I'm getting a little more towards external storytelling. Do the voices, how do you sort of leverage those insights, those consumer insights that shaped the technical briefs to the innovation team? How do you leverage that at the moment where scale up is happening and you're starting to think about the the market strategy in terms of communicating the story back to the consumer that you said this is what you needed and now we are meeting that need. Um, It just seems to me that that one of the uh, true strengths uh, of P&G is the ability to sort of move that story from from the moment that it was at the the home or at the, the point of the touch point in the consumer's life and pull it through the entire innovation process to the marketing strategy and back into their hands. Yeah. It, we have a group of people whose job is um, focused on the, the translation of what the consumers are telling us and, and helping um, frame a technical product story. And, and we call that product research at p It's actually a function. Uh, the individuals who do products research are technologists, uh, scientists and engineers by training. But they're also um, very familiar with the sociologic and anthropometric and um, and science elements that are necessary to kind of be the Rosetta Stone, if you will, that <laughs> gets you from the consumer story to what might be possible from a technical standpoint. And they engage with the technologists and engineers who are in the lab to be able to uh, define what's possible. And so the first conversations are conversations about possibility. So, so this is so interesting. In the enterprises that we've worked with at Untold Content, it's often we, we often sort of see some division between consumer insights and uh, the innovation teams or the scientists uh, and the product engineers. It sounds like certain uh, professionals on the technical track actually um, – get specialized training or sort of have, uh, it's an interesting blend that I'm hearing where they have technical backgrounds, but are um, also well-trained in uh, anthropology or in, and so some of the qualitative research that we're so familiar with at Untold. And we we find ourselves with our clients often sort of helping to bridge that gap between R&D, consumer insights and marketing um, and it sounds like there's sort of a select function where you're building that kind of uh, left brain, right brain capability I- inside of this. Uh, you said product insights team or Pro- products research, product research team. Um, so, and that you've, you've described it brilliantly. That's exactly what we have, and that's exactly their job description. Um, they they then partner also with on the commercial side. So within our marketing organization, we ha- they have a group of people in marketing that are are responsible for consumer market knowledge. That's called CMK. So mm-hmm. the CMK people do what I'll call the scaled analytics of what concepts and ideas and how do they play with the consumer base in general. So you've got these products researchers in the R&D organization and these CMK professionals in the marketing organization. And together they're able to to round out, create a 360 degree picture of what's possible and how best to storytell. I, I and know build, that... you know, build the brand equity that goes along with that. That's fundamentally the, the job of these folks. Is that sort of organized by brand? Does each brand sort of have its own team or are they cross-functional sort of across the brands in that way? So there's uh, the the R&D organization has a, a group of products researchers and they're assigned to, to different product categories and different brands. And then on the marketing side, the CMK individuals are also assigned to different product categories and different brands Okay, as well. Can so you... there's central organizations. 
and tell me if this is outside of your sort of specific area of expertise in the organization, but can you tell me how that communication and how that collaboration happens? Because it is oftentimes challenging for uh, marketing and research to speak the same language. Yeah, sure. Great question. Um, part of the way we do that is the, the culture that we have. Um, and we actually are co-located. We sit together, right? And so you can, the products researchers can be in the laboratory um, and, the, and the CMK folks can be in the laboratory as well. And so um, that creates a, a richness that exists where we can all be excited about things and, and be available for each other literally in the moment. And so these multifunctional teams that we form are are really um, great sandboxes, you know, and we, we, we create a sandbox and we put these brilliant people from many different functions into the sandbox and we say, play, go do wonderful <laughs> and great things, yes, right? Yes. Uh, but be together as a team mm -hmm. and, and be in each other's space, you know, mm -hmm. your, your, your background and training um, and the job description you've got don't define you and we don't expect you to stay in those lanes. We expect you to be able to, you know, be with each other in different ways and be helpful for each other, right? So, um, it is part of the culture, um, just to bring the conversation full circle that we have in in PNG. It's it's really neat, and I, I know that at PNG there have been a lot of you know lean innovation or or different um, efforts to think entrepreneurially inside of this huge enterprise. And it's neat, you know. I'm a startup founder, of course, and so what you just described is so close to my heart in terms of. Uh, creating a strong culture of people who know what lane they're swimming in, but also are very open and accessible and willing to shift and support one another and and sort of think cross uh, collaboratively in that way. Uh, but that's sort of the typical pain point of an enterprise organization is this sort of siloed thinking and siloed functionality. Absolutely. And there's some great recent examples at Procter & Gamble with respect to that. We've, we've created the P&G Ventures organization, right? Yeah, tell the, me more about that. The Growth Works organization, right? So Lee Radford leads the P&G Ventures organization, and she and her team are doing a brilliant job leveraging all the lean innovation principles and the startup mentality. Um, and some of the products that are flowing out of that, yes. you know, are, are remarkable. Uh, we just highlighted some of them at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas recently. Um, and you give me a quick, do you remember, can you uh, tell there, us a quick, quick highlight of some of those? Well, there's uh, EC30, which is uh, a, a breakthrough technology that's going to transform many of P&G's businesses. It's a, it's a fiber technology that allows us to um, deliver different chemistries on a fiber platform. So one of the things that is very striking um, when you step back and think about it is that many of the products that we sell, whether it's shampoos or body washes or mouthwash or laundry detergent, they're big jugs of things. And most of the, most of the magic in those jugs um, it, are ingredients that you can put in the size of a thimble. The rest of it is water. Right. And so we stepped back as a company and said, my gosh, most of our product chassis are water based. Water is a scarce resource. From a sustainability standpoint, the last thing we want to be doing is shipping water around the world. You just sure. don't need to do that. And the extra plastic involved and packaging that. And the shipping and, shipping, and transportation yes. costs. Can, think about this. Yep. Right. What if you could take everything and put it into a wafer? All of the important chemistry allow it to be reconstituted at the moment of use. Which is already so think, involving water. Think about a shampoo that's a <laughs> wafer, and you hold it over your head under the shower. And it, it, the shower, you know, reconstitutes it. Yeah. Th you know, th think about other ways to use that platform um, that are truly transformational. So it improves, in many cases, the product performance, actually, um, the delivery of the chemistries, because you don't have to get them out of an aqueous phase and into where they need to be necessarily, um, and um, reduce cost as well. And so mm -hmm. that was one of the things that we've highlighted recently. Another is Opta, which is the um, cosmetics. It's a device that will um, read uh, your skin tones um, and determine where you've got defects and blemishes, and then actually lay down the cosmetics and almost like a... Um, uh, 
a, a printing fashion. It will literally print the cosmetic huh. on your face to the right degree that's needed to be able to achieve the outcome that you're looking for. So there's analysis involved and then... The, yes. Okay. So. The other is a smart toothbrush that's a totally internet connected toothbrush that can do diagnostics, um, has sensor capability as well. It's part of the Oral B lineup, and there are just some exciting um, opportunities there. So this this whole enterprise of uh, ventures, P and G ventures, and lean innovation is really um, opening up doors that R and D is just thrilled about. And I hear story at the heart of, of so many of the, the sort of, you know, innovations that you've shared so far. And I know you've already alluded to this, but I want to give you a chance to speak to it directly. What role do you think storytelling plays in the art of innovation? I think it's at the center, right? It is core. Um, it becomes... Um, uh, sometimes it becomes the difference between success and... No, not now. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, I genuinely believe that all great ideas of, you know, the world will eventually beat a path to their door. And we've got examples of that at, at PNG where there were great ideas we had a decade before. And had we gotten the storytelling part of it right, um, we might have been able to, you know, benefit from that much, much sooner. So I believe storytelling is foundational to the whole process of innovation. Even when you think of... Um, leading an organization, right, as an innovation leader. I lead an organization of a few hundred people. They're located um, all around the world, very diverse um, set of responsibilities and diverse skills. And uh, to ensure that they um, are inspired and, and are passionate about what they're doing, that they're in touch with the culture that we really want to set, um, storytelling is front and center and all of that. We've got a lot of new hires, pe folks who've just joined the company recently, um, and making them appreciate the culture that they're in. And some of our PVPs, those are our principles, uh, values, and purpose statement. Um, the way we bring that to life is through storytelling. So our culture is actually the robustness of our culture is in large measure due to the ability to storytell. And our best leaders are great storytellers. They, they can create vision and passion and communicate, um, you know, in, in ways that are, are impactful. Absolutely. Can you tell us about some of the types of internal uh, culture building uh, storytelling strategies that you see. So how do you, for instance, how do you set a culture that's comfortable with failure? How do you set a culture that um, that aligns with the, the purpose and the mission and the values of the organization? Um, can you share with us some of the sort of techniques you hear used by some of those innovation leaders? Yeah, some of the, some of the key values that we try to inculcate into a new employee, um, really relate to the consumers first, right? So don't get lost in the data, the, the, <laughs> the data or the, the aura of what the company really is and, and where you sit, you know, our job is to, to delight the consumer daily. And so just getting that message across is critically important. So you've got people thinking about the the, their purpose in the right in the right way. Um, the other thing is that we do the right thing under all all situations and all circumstances. We're going to be very deliberate. We're going to be very evidence based in the way we approach things, um, and we're going to challenge you um, to be part of a team that is very focused on on those precepts and principles as well. So not being afraid to speak up or to create a culture that's comfortable with challenge. I think at um, at Pixar, they call it plussing, ah, yeah. where they're, they're inside of a, a, a pitch or a con concepting meeting, and uh, they have intentional sort of uh, folks in the room whose intention is to help facilitate critical feedback and make sure it doesn't get too tense or negative, um, that, that it's, it's building upon the idea. Absolutely, right? So everyone has a voice. They have a knowledge set. That's part of the beauty of the diversity that we're all in. These multifunctional teams that we intentionally put together in that sandbox I was talking about, um, we make it clear that 
you, you have a voice in every aspect of the problem statement, even if it's outside of your field of experience, it's okay to talk about that. Um, we need that input that, that creates richness and vibrancy in the idea. It strengthens and amplifies the opportunity as well. Um, and, uh, lastly, I would say that, uh, you know, success is directly related to that, um, and failure is part of that process, right? So failing fast is what we try to do and failing cheap, right? <laughs> sure, so yes, yes. we we will and and epic failures are the ones <clears throat> where you fail uh, where you don't learn much, but it's very expensive and brilliant failures are the ones where you learn a lot cheaply. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, right? And and that's what lean innovation is all about is is to, you know, what are the create a minimum viable prototype, you know, get out and test that immediately um and then iterate, right? And yes. if if your hypothesis is invalid, pivot mm-hmm. and then yes. and go again, but do that quickly, do that inexpensively and do that often, right? Yes. And yes. that is the thing that, you know, we that's part of the cultural dynamic we've worked really hard to create um and failure is people love telling stories about their failures really often i will they do yes i mean it's (laughs) look look at what we did you know it sounded so great at the at the beginning and boy was that dumb um at the end and 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 so we have fun telling those stories with each other and sharing those right i've mentioned this before on the podcast but um there's uh, there's a, a sort of trend that I've seen in the innovation community where uh, teams will bring failure cake ah, when yeah, they're ce- they celebrate the failure. They sort of like have a cake that represents what went wrong and they all eat it together and talk about it. And it, it adds this level of visibility and it, it sort of takes all the fear and vulnerability. It, it kind of lessens it. It's not that it's not there, but uh, but it sounds like you're able to, to sort of celebrate that as a, a, a win in terms of learning. Most definitely, yeah. Most definitely, it's not not about pride in that that moment. Got to strip oh, gosh, away your pride. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and we look for that when we're trying to hire individuals. You know, the the comfort and ability to do that, folks who can, um, you know, be energized by the notion of. Um, discovery and and the aha moment and the, oh my gosh, I wish I had thought about that differently, um, and being with groups of people in that context, right? So we really look for folks who are comfortable um, in team settings and, and have you know track records of being successful in, in team environments. I, I believe innovation today genuinely is a team sport. Um, most of the greatest discoveries and ahas, certainly that we see at PNG, were were driven by teams of people um, who amplify and build on on uh, the kernel of an idea and, and and contribute in that way. And many of the great discoveries um, in science and engineering that are happening all around us right now are truly team sports. I mean, the, the CRISPR gene editing kinds of things, the you know. Um, uh, breakthroughs in health and medicine. It is such a wonderful time to be in uh, innovation and science and technology. It really is. Almost daily, there are things that are just, yeah. Yeah. you know, uh, charging the imagination. I couldn't agree more. I think the days of the solo garage guru are they're they're kind of over. And that doesn't mean people won't rise into leadership positions or that we won't admire certain brilliant individuals, but. The stories that I hear from leaders who are really in it at an enterprise level or or even at the startup level, your startup will have a much less likelihood of success if you're not engaging in community, building those relationships, and continuing to think in an interdisciplinary way. Absolutely. I mean, if, if you go look a bit back in history, um, many of the great innovators, um, you know, Thomas Edison had an, a small army of people but working with him. we don't talk him, about that right? in history, right? I know we don't. We, we tend to glorify um, the individual. We do. And, and I think if they were alive and with you in the moment and on this podcast, they would tell you, my gosh, you want to see what's going on. It wasn't just me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So I, I want to dig a little deeper as you're a scientist at, at your core and, of course, uh, have grown into so many other uh, capabilities in your leadership as well. But I want to dig into evidence Yes. and the role that it plays inside of an innovation story, inside of a, a prototype pitch or a concept pitch or a technical brief. How, 
how do scientists and product engineers and everyone who is that data-driven, evidence-driven kind of thinker, you know, how do you sort of um, determine, how do they determine in that in that moment of needing to pitch their big idea, how much evidence is too much or too little? Yeah, it's a great point because, you know, we were all trained to, you know, lay everything out on the table as students, right? <laughs> you lay it all out and you critique it and uh, pressure test it and argue over it. And, yes. um, and, and it's important to be evidence-based, right? You've got to be evidence-based um, as part of your pitch um, or your story will ultimately fail, right? So, and you've got to be balanced in that, in that moment too. So um, you need to let everyone know what is certain and what is uncertain still. Mm -hmm. And so part of the um, elements of a great story or a great pitch is the compelling, you know, a clear, concise statement of the compelling product opportunity or technical product story in a way that's balanced, that shows you've you've thought about it in a 360 degree way and you know what its warts and flaws potentially could be. And then how you're going to test those to make sure that they aren't, you know, fatal uh, to the proposition as well. So especially inside R and D, um, the ability to sort of paint the picture of it's not really just about laying the evidence on the table. It's about thinking through the the data or the evidence that's not yet there. Absolutely. Too. And admitting that, accepting that, getting on the same page, because um, c can you share some sort of examples of pitches that went well and pitches that did not go well? And you don't have to say what the product or idea was, but just sort of the strategy, you know, w was it that they, uh, the ones that didn't go well, were they sort of overly formal? Was it sort of, I know it all? What, what, what are some of the pitfalls you sort of see innovators struggling with as they balance that, that evidence uh, yeah, you've you've got to be prepared to have you know the the elevator speech version of what you're go you're going to convey or communicate, um, not the PowerPoint version, and I think that's where we tend to get lost a lot these days. So um, you've got to be able to articulate it in a conversation within 180 seconds um, for any senior R&D leader, for any senior uh, commercial leader at, at Procter & Gamble. Um, it's got to be that simple and that intuitive. So working to get a a clear and cogent story um, into that kind of a framework is important. And we spend a lot of time doing that. So in our innovation reviews, we are very focused on, on a few key elements and make sure those are communicated in about three minutes. Oh, can you share the template? Well, it's, it's, there's no, <laughs> no secret around it, right? It, right. It, it really is a statement of the from uh, the consumer standpoint, so go back to How the does beginning. How it impact the consumer? Yeah, what was the consumer's tension point? What did he and she share with, to, uh, with us that said, this could, be, this could change my life? So do that with the elements that relay the elements that they felt were critically important to them and in a very succinct fashion define what the product opportunity is. Part one. Part two is what's the technical product story yeah. that solves that tension in a way that makes good sense. And then part three is what's the size of the prize for the company and the return on investment that's going to be available to us. What is the investment that's going to be required? And then what's the mm -hmm. return on the investment that's going to play forward? Does feasibility, is that does that tend to be part uh, of the template or is it sort of the next step after that first conversation goes well? Well, that's the first three minutes, right? Then the next three minutes, <laughs> then you need to be clear about what are the, the what are the barriers? Mm -hmm. how, how can we deal with those? Are those the kinds of things that we're capable of dealing with ourselves? Or are we going to need help in doing that? Um, if so, what does the help look like? How much time is it going to take to get to those, those key answers? Um, you know, and, and, a more detailed plan, I guess, in, in terms of what needs to be true to be successful. Thank you so much for sharing that that particular, you know, the, those sort of elements, those drivers that, that lead to success in that very critical high stakes moment. One of the key things, too, that um, 
we have to think about is um, in many of our businesses, they're regulated businesses, right? So there are external stakeholders that need to be part of this decision-making process. So skip line, new paragraph. Once we get done with the <laughs> internal storytelling, there's an external storytelling element for those folks who adjudicate the product, approve the product. That could be the Environmental Protection Agency. It mm -hmm. could be the Food and Drug Administration, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, and we have to, what we do in those settings is storytelling, but it's a different of a different nature, right? It's very fact-based, evidence-based. It's uh, reass building reassurance and confidence that the product is um, going to be safe and effective. Um, and they're going to have questions about, have you thought of, about all of these other elements? And we, have have to, we will have had to have done our homework in those areas as well and be ready in that moment uh, to be convincing. In that you know, way too. For, for those types of entities, how does that l the starting point of the consumer's voice, the consumer's need or desire, how does it sort of change when you're communicating it to to entities in that way? Is that still the lead up, or do you find you know some of the sort of societal impacts being so not so much about the individual uh, consumer, for instance, or a personal transformation? But do you find yourself sort of uh, or is there a trend to speak more to societal impact? Or do you still need to address impact with those other audiences? Yeah, there has to be purpose, right? Um, and and it could be on the public health scale, yes, sure. right? So, you know, these these some of the technologies that we actually um, are involved with are fundamentally could transform public health as we yes, know it. And yeah. so the, the regulatory agencies are very interested in knowing why we believe that's the case um, and and how can we ensure that we're going to be good stewards of, of yes. the product and, and, um, and the public trust that comes as a result of that. Um, on the environmental side, right, our products are all, um, are all viewed from a, a, a product and environmental safety standpoint as well. So end of life. What your after the consumer's done using what the pro right, the product right. environment yes what yeah. what are the environmental impacts of the product um, if it goes down the drain if it goes up into the atmosphere sure. if it goes into solid waste mm -hmm. you know and as a responsible manufacturer we're accountable for that and and in fact we hold ourselves accountable for that as well and, and want to be leaders in those areas and so those those are the types of conversations you find with the stakeholders outside of the company and they are critical partners in the in the success of your innovation as well. Absolutely. Are there any sort of favorite innovation stories that are emerging now out of the work that you're doing, either at P&G or the Livewell Collaborative that you'd like to share? Yeah, sure. I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we're doing um, in the product safety organization, um, we've got a whole safety innovation program. And how do we predict the safety of products for the users, so human safety and environmental safety. And we're doing a lot of things related to um, uh, toxicogenomics, where we can understand what the impact of a substance or an ingredient is going to be um, in a biological sense without necessarily having to test it in animals. So we've got a whole effort in animal alternatives, which we're very, very proud about. Yes. And that involves um, understanding what's occurring um, at the basic molecular level, at the mm -hmm. genomic level, mm -hmm. um, in certain cell systems. And we're able to test those in cell systems rather than in animals. Um, as, if you think about healthcare products in particular, the FDA requires um, many, many, many years of uh, testing and yeah. clinical trials. And before you can even get into clinical trials they require trials in in different animal species right sure, yes. um, and how do you how do you um, uh, work to ensure you've got confidence and and understanding at the biological level without necessarily having to go through all of the historic testing yes, and so yeah. we're, we're able to do some computer modeling and coupling that with toxicogenomics to do um, you know uh, forecasting and predicting of what certain um, biological responses will be even before we get to a living organism. Is that thanks to the immense amount of data that have been collected over the years that, that we're at this point now that we can sort of start to see trends rather than having to go back to the lab? 
Exactly. Fascinating. Um, and so we're able to, there's enough database material out there. Um, and we've actually got a, a research program where we're partnered with the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, they have a center for uh, computational toxicology at EPA, and um, we're partnered with them to do some evaluations of some of these new models and, and methods and techniques where we're looking at um, the expression of certain proteins at the genetic level um, um, once a cell is exposed to a particular chemical. And so literally you can bring things down to the cellular and molecular level um, and get some great insights on biological pathways, toxicological pathways, um, and do some, do some rapid screening that allows you to move forward in a really smart way without creating... Um, stress or anxiety in preclinical testing or in clinical testing settings. Are the regulatory agencies keeping up with the speed of innovation in this space? Yeah. By and large, as I mentioned, one of the pr research projects we have is joint with the Environmental Protection Agency. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, yes, yes, they are. Uh, in in another like area with the Food and Drug Administration in the area of naturals and botanicals and how do you establish the safety and effectiveness of naturals and botanicals. Mm -hmm. We're partnered with the Food and Drug Administration in terms of laying out a, a framework that can allow for confidence building around those kinds of questions as well. So fascinating. So, you know, I, I want to ask you one last question because I know your time is very precious, but I, you've shared so many pieces of advice already. But if you had to sort of conclude with a few key pieces of advice to folks on innovation teams or other innovation leaders across any sector um, in terms of leveraging the power of story to build culture or get buy-in or speed up their rate of innovation, what would you give as your advice? Well, I'd say first, be open-minded and, and um, to working with a group of people that can together shape a story. Don't, don't think you have to do this on your own. Um, and so find some friends who can help you shape that in a way that is impactful. Um, fundamentally, I think we try to do it all ourselves often. Um, and, and we spend a lot of time being very deliberate and practicing it. And, you know, just do the pitch to your six-year-old child or, you know, do the pitch to that physician <laughs> sitting over in the corner, even though you're the engineer, or do the pitch to that marketing person. Um, and, and if they look at you and go, I don't quite get it, tell me more, um, you know, shape it. Um, so be open-minded, okay, um, be the, a team player. What's the most wild sort of risk you've taken to pitch an idea to someone, an unusual kind of... Uh, setting, for instance. <laughs> in an unusual setting? Maybe to a child, or you mentioned, you know, if you're at the bus stop, oh. just try it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can um, you think of one from your own experience? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, or one that uh, one of your scientists has shared before? Uh, uh, without being too disclosing, um, having conversations with our grandparents is actually hugely helpful. Um, and so in not in the son and daughter kind of way, but in the, hey, what, what is it you're struggling with kind of way? So the Live Well Collaborative does this. And, and that's part of what Procter & Gamble's invested in, in terms of our open innovation platform, is uh, to create this um, nonprofit corporation together with the University of Cincinnati that allows for us to explore product opportunities among the aging consumer mm. and have conversations with them around their tension points as well. And so um, I've been in several situations where I've had conversations with um, my relatives mm -hmm. um, and, and done it in a way that wasn't um, their, their relative. Uh, and it, it was eye-opening. Interestingly, if you take, uh, they were actually more disclosing to a complete stranger than they were to me oh, as I'm their- sure as their grandchild, right? Sure. Um, and I think that's because they felt more comfortable sharing their story um, in a way where their grandchild wasn't going to be filtering it in context of the family dynamic. Sure, definitely. I could so see I've that seen a few too. examples of that, and, it, and that was really an epiphany, right? Part of the secret sauce that I think we've, we've got at the Live Well Collaborative is that the students are remarkable in being able to relate with consumers um, of all ages, but in particular seniors. 
I, I feel like this advice applies to, to so many elements of our society and communities right now, that willingness to talk to a stranger and sort of open up and try to meet them where they're at and relate to one another. It's, it's seems more critical than ever right now. And I could imagine, of course, beautiful, interesting ideas or insights coming from that 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 are also, of course, related to the speed of innovation and, and how fast we can sort of understand one another and build upon that. Most definitely. Matt, I'm so grateful to have had this time with you. I, I think that the insights you've shared around the importance of impact, collaboration, using stories to create culture inside of an innovation team. This has uh, been so beneficial. So thank you. I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm delighted to be here. And, and, and I'm loving what you're doing with your enterprise and your startup and, and the energy and passion you're bringing to it. It is so, so important um, in its own right and um, for all of us who are living life in the innovation space. Yes. I, I think passion is something I, that was, I meant to say that too, that this entire conversation, if you were in this room with us, you'd feel the energy and the enthusiasm. And it's, it's palpable. I hope that you can hear that on the other side of, of the mic. <laughs> and that 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 ability to communicate your passion, I think it goes really far in terms of moving innovation forward. Wonderful. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 